billion dollar structural deficit. After 43 consecutive tax hikes, Maryland's overall economic performance was 49th out of 50 states. Uh, businesses, jobs, and taxpayers were fleeing the state in record numbers, and an overwhelming majority of Marylanders believed that the state was way off track and headed in the wrong direction. We faced the daunting tasks of turning our economy completely around and making our state open for business again so we could put more Marylanders back to work. On my first full day in office, we submitted the first balanced budget in a decade, which eliminated nearly all of the structural deficit which we inherited. Instead of uh, raiding special funds and resorting to typical budgetary gimmicks, we rolled up our sleeves and made tough choices to tighten our belts. To this day, uh, in the entire seven years since I became governor, we have not imposed a single tax increase. Uh, instead, we have cut taxes, tolls, and fees seven years in a row by more than $2.7 billion. And we put all of that money uh, back into the pockets of hardworking Maryland families, small businesses, and retirees, and back into our growing economy, which helped create the biggest economic turnaround in America. When the global pandemic struck two years ago, uh, we were plunged into an unprecedented fiscal crisis that threatened to wipe out all of our hard-won economic progress. The state comptroller uh, was projecting an immediate 50% decrease in revenues and projected a revenue loss of $2.8 billion. Once again, we took immediate decisive actions, instituting a complete budget and hiring freeze with the exception of emergency expenses related to COVID-19 and I vetoed every single piece of legislation uh, that had substantial increases in spending, 22 of them. Last year, we introduced and enacted nearly unanimously the Relief Act of 2021, which included uh, the largest tax cut in state history and provided a total of $1.45 billion in urgently needed tax relief and economic stimulus for struggling Maryland families, small businesses, and those who lost their jobs due to the global pandemic. We also reached an historic bipartisan budget agreement uh, to responsibly invest state and federal relief into our workforce and our economy. And as a direct result of all of those actions, we once again have one of the best economic recoveries in America. We're creating jobs at a rate that is twice as fast as the rest of the country. And a national survey recently named Maryland as the single most improved state for business in America. The entire mission of our administration has been to leave the state in a stronger fiscal position than when we found it. Today, after seven years of hard work and holding the line, the state of Maryland is projecting a long-term, structurally balanced budget for the first time in nearly a quarter century. Rather than leaving a structural deficit, we will leave a long-term budget surplus and a rainy day fund with a record $3.6 billion in reserves, all of which is critical to preserving our AAA bond rating and which keeps us prepared for any future crisis while also allowing us to accelerate a number of important projects and priorities. With this budget, we will also deliver more than $4.6 billion in tax relief for hardworking families, retirees, and small businesses, which will bring the total tax relief delivered during our administration to $7.3 billion. Our initiative will eliminate the taxation of all income for Maryland retirees by responsibly phasing in relief over the next six years, removing 70,000 lower income seniors from the tax rolls immediately in the first year alone. Uh, this is not just good for our economy, 
it's also good for our quality of life. Our seniors uh, deserve to have the peace of mind to know that they can afford to stay right here in Maryland, uh, where they have spent their lives working and raising a family and where they contribute, continue to contribute so much. We're also providing broad-based tax relief to hardworking Marylanders by permanently expanding the Enhanced Earned Income Tax Credit, which will help roughly 295,000 Maryland working families. For far too long, uh, politicians in Annapolis have resorted to the same failed overreach, overspend, and overtax policies of the past, which created the massive de deficits that we have spent the past seven years digging our state out of. Uh, we have worked hard over the last seven years to change that mentality, and we have fought, uh, fought to let Marylanders keep more of their hard-earned money in their own pockets. Last year, we brought together re Republicans and Democrats and nearly unanimously passed the largest tax cuts in state history. Now the state is in even better financial shape than ever before. And with struggling families and retirees getting squeezed by inflation and higher costs across the board, there is no reason why we cannot once again put the politics aside uh, to get this done for the people of Maryland. Our FY 2023 budget also provides additional relief and enhanced benefits for underserved Marylanders, including recipients of electric and utility assistance, temporary disability assistance, and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, we're able to make these commitments while continuing to fund all of Maryland's top priorities. Uh, for the eighth year in a row, our budget includes record funding for K through 12 education, investing uh, the most ever, $8.15 billion into K through 12 education, which is more than $150 million uh, above and beyond the education spending formulas proposed by the legislature. Uh, our administration has now invested $723 million more than the legislature's statutory K through 12 mandates called for. This is the fourth budget that our casino lockbox initiative, uh, which we pushed to enact, has allocated that revenue to go directly into the schools. It has put an additional $598 million directly into local school systems without the need for any state or local tax hikes. This budget continues our commitment to expand access to early childhood education programs, including $144 million to support full day pre-K for three and four year olds. Uh, we're committing another $10 million to our highly successful boost program, which has now provided over $50 million in scholarships for deserving students. Our capital budget includes a record shattering $1 billion investment in additional school construction funding. That's $300 million above the total of all the annual funding requests from every single jurisdiction, which will allow us to dramatically accelerate our historic initiative to bring every single school in the state into the 21st century. Our budget will also provide $601 million more for higher education projects including larger new investments for all of our HBCUs. And we're also providing record funding for our community colleges, where every uh, priority project that is ready for funding will be funded. Uh, we have increased state support per student at our community colleges by 130%. Our $6.8 billion 2023 capital budget funds all capital budget mandates and all legislative pre-authorizations, and uh, we are also able to accelerate a number of important projects. We are uh, continuing our balanced approach to infrastructure with $1.4 billion for roads and bridges and $1.3 billion for transit. Uh, we have invested far more in both roads and transit than any other administration in Maryland history. 
Uh, and we are continuing to move forward on nearly all of the highest priority infrastructure projects uh, in every single jurisdiction all across the state. Through the pandemic, uh, Marylanders have taken advantage of our parks, our state parks, in record numbers. Uh, this budget directs nearly $75 million to the Maryland uh, Park Service. This is the largest investment in 20 years. For the seventh year in a row, we are once again fully funding Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts. And for the fifth year in a row, we are fully funding program open space and other land preservation programs. And our capital budget includes a record $850 million for environmental programs, most of which will advance projects that improve water quality and invest in critical maintenance infrastructure and other improvements at Maryland's parks and open spaces. Uh, we are committing a record nearly $1 billion for mental health and substance abuse programs to continue to combat the heroin and opioid epidemic and other mental and substance abuse disorders. And I want to thank my partner in government, Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, for continuing to lead on these efforts. As we have previously announced, uh, this budget also makes historic commitments to public safety. Our Refund the Police initiative includes more than $500 million to recruit and retain more quality officers, to increase diversity, uh, expand community policing efforts, to improve training, and to teach better de-escalation techniques, and to provide body cams and other technology and equipment upgrades for state and local police. Our budget uh, also supports our state's ongoing COVID-19 response. Uh, commits record funding to our local health departments. It spans services for developmentally disabled Marylanders. Provides additional support for behavioral health providers and establishes new equity programs to address health disparities and to improve access to primary care. The submission of this budget today shows just how far we have come over the last seven years. This, of course, is just the first step in the budget process, and we look forward to our briefing uh, with legislative leaders this afternoon and to working together with both the House and the Senate in the weeks ahead in a bipartisan and collaborative fashion to enact a final budget which seizes uh, the historic opportunity we now have. I'm going to open it up for questions in just a moment, uh, but first I want to acknowledge the incredible efforts of uh, Secretary Brinkley, Deputy Secretary Mark Nicole, uh, Terry Garrity, and everyone at the Department of Budget and Management who has helped make Maryland's approach to fiscal discipline a national model. And I'd like to single out one of those tireless public servants today. Uh, John Martin has served in state government for more than 16 years. He's been a part of the budget and management team for more than seven years. And while he's moving on, uh, fortunately, he's not going far. Uh, new treasurer, Derek Davis, has recently named John as the chief deputy treasurer. So at this time, I'm going to present him with a governor's citation uh, to him to recognize his outstanding service and, by extension, uh, to recognize the work that the entire uh, state budget team has done on behalf of Marylanders. Put my mask on here, John. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you. Good luck. By the way, I had another prop in here that I think I, I forgot to put up here. This is uh, budget highlights for the fiscal year and the entire budget book, which is been delivered this morning, and I'm sure anybody that wants to read this tonight will be happy to provide you access to it. Go online. I think you can get it. It might be easier. But with that, we'd be happy to uh, take some questions. It's wonderful to see you back with us, Aaron. <laughs> Why, you know, 
Well, um, that's a great question. You know, the question was why, why usually they're black books. This one is purple. Uh, we just thought this is such a, an historic budget. We wanted to uh, just symbolically show that it's different. It really is a, a bipartisan effort, and uh, purple is red and blue coming together. Uh, it's really what my whole administration has been about. You know, I have a purple surfboard hanging in my office over here uh, because, uh, you know, in the, in the bluest state in America with a big blue wave and a blue year, uh, as a Republican, you know, I, I was able to surf. Uh, and it, so purple is all about, you know, I mean, I was NGA chair, uh, National Governors Association, their color's purple. It's been a kind of a focus of ours, and this is to show that we want to work together, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I, it was a great idea. I can't claim credit for it, though. So I think they look good. Anybody else? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I just uh, learned of uh, Mr. Wiedefeld's uh, resignation yesterday of retirement. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation with uh, Metro. It's going to take uh, a transformative leader. It's an, an enormous job uh, and trying to find the right person to transform and turn Metro around is going to be a, it's going to be a big challenge. But we're, you know, we're going to talk with our uh, our fellow leaders, I've talked with Governor uh, Yunkin last week about Metro. Um, we've talked with our new Transportation Secretary about Metro, and we look forward to working with all of our, our leaders in the region to try to come up with uh, some new leadership. And we thank uh, Paul Wiedefeld who's, uh, for his service there, and we look forward to finding somebody that continue to make some improvements. Um, so we are we are we're phasing it in over six years. Maybe I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Mark Nicole get into some details on that. But you know it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. It's not not even it grows. I think as we go through, but we're starting with the people with the lowest income that need it the most, um, and working our way up. So I'll let Mark touch on that. Thank you, Governor. So the uh, the, the phase in, as the governor said, is not even. Uh, it is over six years. The first year of the phase in. Uh, is uh, t uh, the first 10, it's a $10,000 exclusion. Uh, and as the governor previously remarked, uh, uh, we'll remove 70,000 lower income seniors uh, from the tax rolls and the cost of that's about $188 million in the first year. They are not. Um, we do have a problem with, uh, you know, a, 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 an increased uh, problem of bodies at the, uh, at the medical examiner, but that's not COVID related. I mean, there a few are, but uh, really those cases are mostly homicides and or opioid uh, overdose doses. So uh, the, the issue is not a, technically a COVID related question, but it's a problem that we're trying to address. Uh, with respect to the nursing licenses, with the cyber attack, uh, uh, on the healthcare uh, health websites, that the uh, at the, the board of nursing had some issues, and so uh, we're trying to do a lot of that by hand. But we, in our state of emergency, waive the requirements so that uh, nobody's license will expire and they can continue to work. So that it doesn't really impact anybody yet, but they're they're trying to get them you know finalized. In the meantime, they can continue to work. We are encouraged. First of all, we're going to have a briefing on COVID tomorrow, so we're focused on the budget today. I've been having briefings every day. Uh, I had a uh, long conversation with the other governors with the White House yesterday, our internal team. Uh, we're encouraged on the numbers, first of all, we are encouraged uh, that we have seen declining numbers for depending on the metric which data point we're looking at uh you know for five seven ten days uh you know of encouraging numbers and 
Uh, that's, that's a trend we obviously like to see. Uh, however, the numbers are still much higher than they were before. So even if you're coming down, we're still dealing with the, the emergency and the crisis. But it's getting better, and we're going to talk in a lot more detail about that tomorrow as we get uh, everything looked at today. Yesterday, we had a conversation on the testing uh, with the White House. Um, I, I uh, have a concern in that, uh, you know, look, we have plenty of testing because we continued to lead the country and acquire tests from the very beginning. Everywhere we could find them, we've, we've got plenty of... Uh, uh, PCR tests and rapid tests, but uh, we did order millions more, uh, and we're expecting a huge shipment this week. And they were all, uh, all of our vendors called us late Friday to say that uh, the White House's announcement on Friday had frozen all the orders and that they were taking all of the tests that were going to go to us in the other states. And so I raised that on the call with the White House yesterday, uh, pretty uh, forcefully. Uh, m multiple other governors of both parties agreed that they were having the same problem, and uh, we're trying to get the White House to address it. But basically, the new program to mail tests out to people directly, they didn't produce any new tests. They just took all the tests off the shelf uh, that we were supposed to get on trucks to come here. We already had uses for them, like, like Monday, uh, and now it may be several weeks from now, somebody might get one in the mail, but that's not really helpful. So for people around the state who are looking for a test who can't get one, what do you say? We do have tests fairly widely available, and we opened up 20 new uh, testing centers. The situation you were talking about in Hartford County, um, we're trying to get briefed from ha uh, Hartford County. It was not, uh, you know, it was a county site we weren't involved in with a contractor that's not a state contractor with some type of saliva-based tests, and the tests were okay, but they just were, I think, backed up, whatever this, whoever this contractor is, and they got, uh, someone didn't get, get, didn't get done. But I don't have any details. You have to call Hartford County about that. I don't have an exact number. Uh, I think we, we had uh, total orders of you know, 4.8 million or something like that, uh, but they were they're over a different period of time, so I can't give you exactly. I just know, you know, and part of the discussion with the White House was, uh, well, eventually you will get them. Well, but but the early ones are the ones that we needed right away, and they're saying we'll have we'll have plenty of them in February and March, but you know we needed them yesterday. These are rapid tests. Rapid tests. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe I'll let the budget expert tell you about my, you know, it's a little bit of all those things. So it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of tightening the belt. It's a lot of uh, dramatically increased revenues because of our growing economy, more people working, more businesses open, uh, all of our revenues way up. And uh, certainly it didn't hurt that with the federal stimulus that uh, was pumped into the economy and some of the stuff that came in. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of things that we've done over the past two years and the last seven years that have put us in this position. I don't know if you have anything you want to... He says, he says I actually covered that one pretty well. <laughs> What's that? No. 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 I'm sorry. You know, I think it's a pretty good process. Uh, you know, we, our team here, and, and there's a much bigger team to work for all of these guys, you know, spend a long time putting the budget together. Uh, we submit it to the legislature. They will debate different priorities, and we'll, we sit down with them. Last year, we really reached a historic agreement with the Speaker and the Senate President on not only budget priorities, but also on the largest tax cut in history. So I'm hopeful uh, we're in such much better shape than we were then. Uh, we can uh, reach some similar agreements, but this is obviously the start of the process. There's whatever 80 some days left for them to review it and talk to us and themselves about it, and we'll, we'll hopefully come out of it with a good, uh, probably, you know, great result. You know, it's a sad uh, situation. It's the last thing the city of Baltimore needs is another scandal of this type. But I don't know any of the details of the, of the investigation. Obviously, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, this is more of a question for the leaders of Baltimore City and the attorney general, who's the only one that could take that kind of action. If, 
But, uh, you know, I, just, I don't have any opinion other than it's, uh, it's very unfortunate, and hopefully uh, we can get all the facts and get to the bottom of it. Yeah, thank you.